Hello and welcome. Let's talk today reproductive system. So here when we talk reproductive system, here we're going to be able to go through and we're going to be able to check out basically both male and female. What we'll do first is we'll check out male and then we'll jump over to female. Now when we go through and we talk generally speaking reproductive system, I'd like you to know most organ systems that we've gone through all semester and we've talked about, how they're going to function so most organ systems we've spoken about function almost entirely to maintain the well-being of an individual. Now when we talk reproductive system, you'll see the reproductive system appears to be slumber until puberty hits. Now when we go through and we talk, we'll go through first male reproductive system. And here we'll check out first the, the anatomy and then we'll jump into the physiology. And we talk about the anatomy. Here you can see we've got external genitalia and it's going to be composed of the scrotum and the penis. And we talk penis. The penis is considered um, the male copulatory organ, male sexual organ you can think of there. Now here when we talk testes, the testes are what's found within the scrotum, right? Now the testes is where we produce sperm. So that's where sperm production occurs. Now, and again, testes are within the scrotum. And now when we talk sperm, sperm is going to be delivered to the exterior through a system of ducts. And these ducts are going to include, we'll see the epididymis, ductus deferens, and then the ejaculatory duct. Eventually, the sperm will make its way into the urethra, and from the urethra, then it's expelled out of the male body. Now, male reproductive system also is going to con is also going to include accessory sex glands, which are going to produce. We'll see uh, the rest of semen because when we talk semen, semen is sperm plus secretions from these various glands and the testes. So here we've got the paraseminal vesicles, the one prostate gland, and the and the bubo-urethral glands. Now they're all going to empty their secretions into the ducts during ejaculation. Right? We learned all of that from anatomy. Here you can appreciate the seminal vesicles. Here we've got the prostate. And here was one of the bulbo-urethral glands. So when they all empty their secretions, they empty their secretions, you can see basically right into that same pathway as sperm is going to be making its way into. So here we have then first, let's start with the testes within the scrotum, right? The scrotum there is to provide the testes with a temperature, uh, with an environment ambient temperature that's slightly sl uh, lower than that of the... So here we can see the duct system. We'll say it starts, uh, basically when we go through, you can see the duct system here, but when we go through the male parts, here you can see you've got the scrotum, again providing uh, a temperature that's going to be slightly lower than that of the rest of the body to the testes for sperm production. So the testes you can see then uh, I've got this epididymis right back in here and the epididymis then is going to store the sperm and then from there the sperm is going to make its way into the vas deferens, the ductus deferens and here you can see that ductus deferens is going to be hooked up to the ejaculatory duct so the ductus deferens and the seminal vesicles will empty their contents into the ejaculatory duct and then from the ejaculatory duct those secretions are going to continue through into the urethra and then again we said be uh, expelled out of the body so then here we can see we've got the penis the penis, then we've got uh, basically now inside, you can see, we'll, we'll go back to the penis, penis, you can see uh, you've got the different parts there, uh, corpora cavernosa, corpus spongiosum, helping to construct that penis. And then so here we move in, you can see then you've got the bladder, okay? So here we talked about the prostate gland, and you can see how the prostate gland is encircling then the urethra. And then back here we've got uh, basically the anus and then the rectum and basically the opening there. So male reproductive and urinary systems you've seen are basically connected to one another. You don't have that in the female. Here in the male, then you see that connection right inside of here. In the female, what happens is you would see basically this part right in here, uh, basically open up right in here. So you would have one opening for the, uh, for the bladder, basically, and then a reproductive opening. And then here you can see the rectal or uh, anal canal opening basically there. So you would have three different openings there where we don't see that here in the male. So male parts uh, we've got there, okay, the scrotum, sac of skin, super, and superficial fascia hangs outside that abdominal pelvic cavity. It contains that pair of testes, and we said it provides a temperature that's slightly lower than that of the body. So you can see there about three degrees Celsius. And lower temperature, we said, is necessary for sperm production, as we 
mentioned a few minutes ago as well. Now, where does the sperm production occur? Where does this occur? It's going to occur in the testes. Where in the testes? Within the seminiferous tubules of the testes. So here we can see, if we move down here, we've got these seminiferous tubules right inside of here. So here, if we were to make a cut right through and turn this around and look at it, this is what you would be seeing. This is the inside of those tubules. So moving back here, you can see they're thick. They're going to have stratified uh, epithelium. That's going to be surrounding central fluid containing lumen. And then here you can see basically you've got uh, spheroid uh, spermatogenic cells that are going to be embedded in cystentocytes. There's also myoid cells there. They're going to be smooth muscle-like cells. They're going to surround each tubule and they squeeze sperm and testicular fluid out of the testes. And then tubules from each lobule form the straight tubule. We'll go through, we'll look at all of that here in the next uh, image that we go through, we check out. So sperm is going to make its way from the seminiferous tubules to the straight tubule, to the ready testes, then to the efferent ductules, and then into the epididymis, and then from the epididymis, it'll make its way basically, uh, you can see into the ductus, into the duct of the epididymis, then which becomes the ductus deferens, the vas deferens, and then you saw the rest of that pathway. So... You can see that pathway again from here. And then here we can see it with seminiferous tubules into then we said the straight tubule, right into the ready testes, and then here into the efferent ductule, and then into the epididymis. And here you can see how the head of the epididymis, you've got all these different segments. Eventually they all come together and they form one duct of the epididymis. And that's what you see right inside of here and it curves around as then basically the vas deferens. And then in vasectomies, this is basically the pathway that gets uh, uh, closed off uh, so sperm doesn't make its way then into the urethra. Now, here is the image that I was showing you. Here you can appreciate this is inside the seminiferous tubules. Now, here you're going to be able to appreciate all the spermatogenic cells. And we're going to go through, we're going to look at spermatogenesis. So we're going to talk about all that. And we're going to see how these cells are going to go from uh, one cell to eventually four sperm cells right inside of here. And here you got the myoid cells, as we mentioned. And then here's some interstitial cells, interstitial endocrine cells. Uh, and you recall from endocrine system are going to be responsible for synthesizing basically testosterone, so we're going to look at that here again. Now let's go through, let's talk then uh, physiology of the male reproductive system. So let's talk male sexual response. We'll see the main phases of male sexual response are going to include, number one, erection of the penis, which will allow that penis to penetrate the female vagina, and then second will be ejaculation. Ejaculation is the process which basically expels semen into the vagina. So let's talk erection. When we talk erection, erection is basically an enlargement and a stiffening of the penis. It's an, an, an enlargement and stiffening of the penis which results from the engorgement of the penis with blood. We'll see during sexual excitement a parasympathetic reflex is triggered. And that parasympathetic reflex, once it gets triggered, it promotes the release of nitric oxide. It promotes the release of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide causes the penile arterioles to dilate and the erectile bodies fill with blood. Expansion of the corpora cavernosa of the penis compresses the drainage veins not allowing that outflow and maintaining a voluminous amount of blood within the penis and an erection. So again, 
arterioles that are normally constricted. Sexual excitement causes the central nervous system activation of parasympathetic neurons, which then lead to the release of nitric oxide, which causes, you could see, the smooth muscle to relax. The arterioles dilate, allowing more blood in, which also causes the corpora cavernosa, we said, to expand, which then diminishes the quantity of blood leaving, so it diminishes venous drainage, which leads to then that engorgement of erectile tissues with blood, and an enlargement and stiffening then of the penis. So this is initiated by sexual stimuli, which could be touching, mechanical stimulation of the penis, or you can see erotic sights, sounds, and smells. And this process can be induced or it can be inhibited by emotions or higher mental activity. Next then we talk ejaculation. Ejaculation is the propulsion of semen. It's the propulsion of semen from the male duct system. Although erection is under parasympathetic control, ejaculation is under sympathetic control. During ejaculation, a few events will take place. Number one, the bladder sphincter muscles constrict, preventing the expulsion of urine or even a reflex of semen into the bladder. Second, the reproductive ducts and the accessory glands contract, emptying their contents into the urethra. And then number three, semen in the urethra triggers spinal reflexes which expel semen from, the se uh, from this urethra. The ejaculatory event is climax or orgasm in the male. Next, let's talk about spermatogenesis. Now, when we talk about spermatogenesis, spermatogenesis is the sequence of events in the seminiferous tubules. It is the sequence of events in the seminiferous tubules of the testes that produce male gametes, or we could say sperm. Now, this process begins around the age of 14, and it continues throughout life as long as testosterone levels, again, are elevated or what they're supposed to be. Gamete formation in both sexes involves meiosis. Meiosis is a unique kind of nuclear division that occurs only in the gonads. If you recall, mitosis, the process by which most body cells divide, mitosis distributes replicated chromosomes equally between two daughter cells. Meiosis, you will see, consists of two consecutive nuclear divisions that follow one round of DNA replication. So don't think DNA replication is going to happen two times too. No, no, no. That is only going to happen once because, right, if we talk about the cell cycle, okay, so here... 
right? We have, uh, let's see here. Because if we talk about the cell cycle, right, this is what's going on here. Right, let's fill in here. What do we have that's going to go in here? G1, S. What's happening here? This is where DNA replication is occurring. So the synthesis. And then here we have G2. And then here we had the M stage, right? Oh, there's a horrible M. Okay, but M stage, you could see that there. Because this consists of then here, you've got prophase, metaphase, oh, this is going to be horrible, uh, anaphase, and then telophase, right? Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. In mitosis, what would we have here? Cytokinesis. But here in meiosis, we have first interkinesis, okay? And then uh, in the second division, in the second division is where you're going to see then basically the separation of the cells, okay? So here now when we go through and we talk then, um, to, oh, wow, how did that happen? That was easy to erase. I didn't know you could just accidentally rub your finger on the mouse and it erases this. What happened? How did it do that? Okay, whoa, okay, I was going to say, okay, there it is. So here now, again, what did I say? I said meiosis, in meiosis, you will see it's going to consist of two consecutive nuclear divisions that follow one round of DNA replication. So this process here is going to happen once. So the cell is going to go from here, make its way into here, make its way into the third, basically, step here, and then it's going to make its way into here. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, interkinesis occurs, and then we start over again. Prophase 2, metaphase 2, anaphase 2, telophase 2, and then you have the separation. Okay, DNA replication is only going to happen once. Now, in meiosis, the product is going to be four daughter cells, right? Four daughter cells instead of two, each with half as many chromosomes as typical body cells, okay? Because most, our body cells, most body cells are going to contain 46 chromosomes. That, again, is a diploid number represented by the 2N. So it's a diploid chromosomal number where it's telling us we have two sets, two pairs of 23, two sets of 23 pairs of chromosomes, right? One pair coming from mom and the other pair coming from dad. There you go, one maternal, one paternal. And they're homologous chromosomes. So where you have something happening in one area, in the other chromosome, it's, it's also going to be happening in the same area. Now, when we talk gametes, gametes, they have only 23 chromosomes. They have a haploid number of chromosomes, right? So that way, the sperm, if it's talking that gamete, has 23. Well, when it meets the egg, which is the other gamete, then, then we're going to have that 23 pairs, right? The 23 and 23 will come, to bind, come together and have a comp combine basically, or combination then of those genes, leading to then 23 sets, 23, uh, 23 pairs. So haploid number is represented by just a letter N, represented by just the letter N. And then we have only one member of, eventually, the homologous pair. So here then, when we go through, we talk meiosis. Meiosis is gamete, basically, uh, formation, you'll see is going to involve meiosis. So meiosis is going to be the process that gametes are going to undergo in order to basically give rise to more gametes, right? Mitosis is the process that our other, the rest of our body cells undergo in order to give rise to new cells, right? Epithelial cells are constantly doing this, right? We talk uh, amitotic cells, amitotic cells, and we're talking like muscle cells and, uh, and neurons and... Uh, and you can talk like red blood cells or, you know, white blood cells because they come from stem cells. So here, when we go through and we talk, then uh, gamete formation, it involves meiosis. 
We're going to have two consecutive cell divisions, we said. They're going to be called meiosis 1 and meiosis 2, followed by only one round of DNA replication. And then again, meiosis produces four daughter cells, not two daughter cells, four daughter cells. What is the function? Why, why do we have to have meiosis occur? There's an important reason there. Number one, because it helps to have half that number of chromosomes. Take us from a diploid number down to a haploid number, which is what we need. Also what it does, it introduces genetic variability, genetic diversity, crossing over, independent assortment. These are all processes that are going to help with genetic diversity. So random alignment of homologous pairs in meiosis 1, right? A random uh, assortment helps to introduce the variability of gametes. And then crossing over, I just mentioned, helps to introduce that variability of our, to our gametes. No two gametes are going to be exactly alike. All are different from the original mother cells as well. Now here we could see this process of mitosis. Now this process of mitosis, you start off with a mother cell and it gives rise then to two daughter cells that are exactly identical to the mother cell. Now in meiosis, you can see here the mother cell is going to now give rise, basically undergoes this uh, process of uh, meiosis, uh, uh, you can see here. And meiosis then forms two daughter cells. Meiosis 1 forms two daughter cells. Now these two daughter cells aren't going to stop there, they're going to continue further. So they enter meiosis 2, and when they enter meiosis 2, you can see here, they'll give rise to two cells each, which creates then four daughter cells which now do not look anything like the mother cell because they have half. Here you had double genetic information. Here we have half. So when this cell now comes together with another basically gonadal cell, then you have double number of chromosomes, 23 pairs. So here's 23. And the other cell will bring its 23, and then we'll have 23 pairs. Now, when we go to we talk meiosis, meiosis is basically two nuclear divisions. Now, they're going to be known as meiosis 1 and meiosis 2, as we have described. And they're divided into meiosis 1 and meiosis 2 into these phases, basically, for convenience. Now, when we go through and we talk, these phases, these phases, mitosis that you see in mitosis and the phases that you see in meiosis, they have the same name. So prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase is what we're going to see here. Now, let's talk meiosis 1. As in mitosis, as in mitosis, chromosomes replicate before meiosis begins. In prophase of meiosis 1, the replicated chromosomes seek out their homologous partners and they pair up with them. During metaphase 1, the chromosomes line up at the spindle's equator. So again, in prophase of meiosis 1, the replicated chromosomes are going to seek out their homologous partners and pair up with them. And then during, during metaphase 1, during metaphase 1, the chromosomes line up at the spindle's equator. 
just like you saw in mitosis, right? To get in even more detail, you would. Uh, I want you guys to know exactly what is going to be happening in prophase one. You'll see nuclear defragmentation occurs, right? The nucleus starts to break apart, and when the nucleus starts to break apart, this is what's going to allow all that genetic information, those chromosomes, to basically make their way out, and then they could start uh, moving about the cell. And then in metaphase, you could see they'll start lighting up at that metaphase plate because the chromosomes are going to be lining up basically like we said uh, at that spindle's equator which is going to be the metaphase plate. Now when meiosis 1 ends, so after metaphase then anaphase and then telophase, right? In telophase what's going to happen? The nucleus is going to start to refragment. It starts to refragment and it starts to basically uh, contain then house all those chromosomes back inside. So here then when we talk meiosis 1 ending, each daughter cell then is going to have two copies of one member of each homologous pair and a haploid chromosomal number. Because the still united sister chromatids are considered a single chromosome. And then when we move into, so meiosis 1, you can see, okay? When we move into meiosis 2 then, we move into meiosis 2, the second meiotic division, the sister chromatids in the two daughter cells of meiosis 1, the set in the second meiotic division now, the sister chromatids in the two daughter cells of meiosis 1 are divided into then four cells. Meiosis, we said, accomplishes two tasks. It reduces the chromosomal number in half. So it reduces the chromosomal number by half. And number two, we said it, it introduces genetic variability thanks to crossing over of the chromosomes and also independent assortment and independent assortment. Now let's go through and let's actually look at this whole process which we will call then spermatogenesis. So spermatogenesis is going to be a summary of events. It's going to be a summary of events that are taking place within the seminiferous tubules. That takes place within the seminiferous tubules. So, mitosis then of spermatogonia. Now, first we'll look at. Now, when we talk forming spermatocytes. During puberty, the stem cells that are called spermatogonia, they are going to divide into two distinctive daughter cells, which we can see here. I like this picture because this picture is showing us in that uh, seminiferous tubule again. Okay, and here we have all those immature spermatogenic cells. And then the closer they are to the lumen, you can see the more mature they are. And here are basically those uh, more mature sperm, and they've got their flagella, and they're ready to go. So what they're going to do is, if we come back into this picture then, you can see here, once they've matured in the tubules, they'll start to swim through, and they'll start to swim into here, and they'll make their way up into here, and then into here, and then eventually all the way through, and they have to keep going. And the journey is not done here, right? When they, Once they get introduced into the female reproductive tract, then they have to go, and they have to find their directions all the way through, and they have to make their way all the way to that egg. Right? The egg doesn't come all the way to it. The sperm has to go all the way to it. So when you talk function of the penis you learned in, uh, in anatomy, the function is it's designed to deliver sperm into the female reproductive tract. And then sperm has that pathway to find the cervix, to make its way from the vagina, find the cervix and make its way into the cervix and go up into the uterus and you know, make its way into the right side because usually uh, one egg is delivered per month. But we'll look at that when we get there then as well. 
So nice picture of the seminiferous tubules, electron micrograph. So here you can see again, like I was saying, during puberty, the stem cells called spermatogonia. So here you can see spermatogonia. This is the stem cell. They're going to divide. And when they divide, they divide into two distinctive daughter cells, which are type A and type B cells. The type A and type B cells you see here. Now the type B cells, they're going to get pushed towards the lumen. They'll get pushed towards the lumen. Where it's going to become a primary spermatocyte destined to produce four sperm. The type A cell, the type A daughter cell, is going to remain at the basal lamina as a precursor cell. It'll remain as a precursor cell. So let's look at meiosis then. Let's look at this process where now we have our spermatocytes and the spermatocytes are going to go to becoming spermatid. Each primary spermatocyte is going to form two smaller haploid cells that are called secondary spermatocytes. The secondary spermatocytes continue on to meiosis II, and they form four daughter cells that are called spermatids. Each round cell you see here okay, is an early spermatid. And they're going to give rise to, you can see here, what we call late spermatid. So these are small round cells with large spherical nuclei. And they're seen closer now to the lumen of the tubule. Spermatid, early spermatid. Let's look at then what we call spermiogenesis where we go from spermatid to sperm. Now each spermatid has the correct chromosomal number for fertilization, which is the N number you can see there. But those cells are non-motile. They still must undergo a process called spermiogenesis during which the sperm elongates and forms a tail. Now the head of a sperm consists almost entirely of its flattened nucleus which is going to contain compacted DNA, which is going to contain compacted DNA, and also a helmet-like acrosome, also a helmet-like acrosome that adheres to the top of the nucleus. And this acrosome is going to contain hydrolytic enzymes. These hydrolytic enzymes, they're going to enable the sperm to penetrate and enter the egg. You can see here the midpiece. The midpiece is going to contain mitochondria. It contains mitochondria. The tail, the tail is a flagellum. It's a flagella. The mitochondria is going to be important because the mitochondria is going to provide the ATP, 
right? The metabolic energy that's needed for the whip-like movements of the tail that are going to propel that sperm along the female reproductive tract. And you may recall from anatomy as well, the primary energy source is fructose for sperm. It's fructose. We also have here sustentocytes. Sustentocytes, if you recall, we went back in here. Well, this picture I think is showing us as well. Right in here. Here's the nucleus of a sustentocyte. It's basically the cell you see right here in yellow. Let me show you here also. Here, we can see these sustentocytes as well. Now, these sustentocytes, they're non-replicating supporting cells. Non-replicating supporting cells, or what we refer to as also nurse cells. They're also called Sertoli cells. They divide the seminiferous tubules into two compartments. The basal compartment and the ad luminal compartment. The sustentocytes, they themselves are also going to provide nutrients and essential signals to the dividing cells, even telling those cells to live or die. They also move the cells to the lumen. They also move the cells to or towards the lumen. Number three, they secrete testicular fluid They phagocytize, they also phagocytize faulty germ cells. And they produce chemical mediators that help regulate spermatogenesis. So the two compartments you can see there as well, we've mentioned. Here you can see you've got that basal compartment about down to about here. And the rest of it is going to be then the ad luminal compartment. The ad luminal compartment. Now, when we go through and we talk about the hormonal regulation, here we can see now, we can mention our endocrine component then. Now, when we talk about the endocrine component, now, when we talk endocrine component, we can see the endocrine component now here. And when we go through this endocrine component, here we're going to look at basically the hormonal regulation of male reproductive uh, functions. So now here when we go through and we talk hormonal regulation of male reproductive function, hormonal interaction between the hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary gland, and the gonads is going to be observed here now very carefully. This is, we'll see a relationship that's called the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis just like we see right inside here. This is called the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. Okay. And what it does, it regulates the act. It's going to regulate the production. It's going to regulate the production of gametes and sex hormones. Here we'll see it's going to be an interaction through basically three sets of hormones. First, GnRH, and then FSH and LH, and then we're going to see testosterone and inhibit. So here when we go through and we talk about this whole access here, let's come to this picture here. Let's go through it and describe it here. So here you can appreciate hypothalamus, pituitary, and here we can see this is basically inside the 
testes then here you've got your interstitial cells right and then here you can see your uh, uh, basically seminiferous tubules and then here's that whole spermi uh, spermatogenesis process so here then when we go through and we talk about the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis the hypothalamus is responsible for releasing gonadotropin releasing hormone GnRH gonadotropin releasing hormone GnRH is going to reach the anterior pituitary and when it reaches the anterior pituitary, it's going to stimulate the release of, we'll see, gonadotropins there. GnRH controls the release of FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, and LH, luteinizing hormone. The binding of GnRH to pituitary cells signals them to secrete FSH and LH into the bloodstream. Now, FSH, okay, FSH stimulates spermatogenesis indirectly. FSH is going to stimulate spermatogenesis indirectly by stimulating Sertoli cells to release androgen binding protein, ABP, as we see here. ABP, androgen binding protein, keeps the concentration of testosterone high, which stimulates spermatogenesis. LH, LH binds to the interstitial endocrine cells. It binds to interstitial endocrine cells, which stimulates testosterone secretion, which stimulates the final trigger for spermatogenesis. Increasing testosterone also stimulates the maturation of sex organs, the development and the maintenance of secondary sex characteristics, sex drive, Right, and all this during puberty. And rising levels of testosterone are also going to feed back. Rising levels of testosterone are also going to feed back. They feed back to inhibit GnRH's release. Inhibin, inhibin we see here as well, is a protein. It's a protein hormone that's going to be produced by the Sertoli cells. It inhibits the anterior pituitary's release of FSH and GnRH. So going back, when we said increasing testosterone also stimulates the maturation of sex organs, the development and the maintenance of secondary sex characteristics, we said, and the sex drive and rising levels of testosterone are going to feed back. Rising levels of testosterone are going to feed back, I told you, to inhibit GnRH's release, also to inhibit LH's release as well. So you can see we not only stimulate GnRH to be inhibited, but we're also going to inhibit FSH and LH there as well. Now when we talk about the mechanisms and effects of testosterone activity, we'll see testosterone is going to be synthesized from cholesterol. In some target cells, testosterone has to be transformed into another steroid in order to exert its effects. Like in the prostate, for example, testosterone is going to get converted to DHT, dihydrotestosterone before it can exhibit its effects. 
That's kind of like insulin we saw. Or, I mean, uh, insulin-like growth factors, right, in relation to growth hormone. So it's kind of like the same thing, right? Growth hormone itself didn't do it. It stimulated the cell, the cell, the tissue, and it generated IGFs, and then they actually caused the effect. So the same thing is going to be happening here with DHT. Now, at puberty, testosterone prompts spermatogenesis, but it also has multiple anabolic effects on the body. For example, muscle growth, skeletal growth, axillary and pubic hair growth, and so on. Testosterone also targets the male reproductive organs, causing them to grow and function properly. Now, in the absence of the hormone, in the absence, this will lead to atrophy and no sperm production. Testosterone replacement therapy then is going to be required. The adrenals also release androgens, right, as we have talked about in both sexes, so you got to remember that. Here you can actually see our testosterone levels, and you can see how testosterone levels at basically birth are very low. Before birth, they have spiked one time, and then after birth, you can see they increase, and then they go back down to very low levels again, and they'll stay low until puberty hits. Once puberty hits, then you can see testosterone levels begin to increase. And these levels, they say, remain increased. Here they're saying till about 60. I don't know about that. Um, even now, uh, you know, testosterone replacement therapy is uh, probably going to become a thing uh, uh, which we never really had kind of for males there. So, um, you know, now they're saying uh, even more research uh, fourth, fifth decade of life is when it starts to come down. So now people are trying to replace that and seeing it's all still early research and they're trying to see if there's any uh, uh, benefits that come from it. You know, uh, in female re uh, hormone replacement therapy, we've seen cancers and all these other things occur. So that's why it's uh, kind of tough and controversial when you get into talking about uh, replacement hormone replacement therapy and uh, it being done the proper way. All right, next in here we have female reproductive anatomy. Then let's go through the female uh, reproductive parts. Now here we go through the female reproductive parts. Here we're going to be able to go through all these various parts. We've got the ovaries, the female gonads, right? They're going to be responsible for producing the gametes, the ova. And then also, just like we saw in the male, they're going to be producing sex hormones here. And the sex hormones here we're going to see now are going to be estrogen and progesterone. And there's some accessory ducts here as well, and that'll include the fallopian tubes, the uterine tubes, the uterus, and also the vagina. Now we talk internal genitalia. Excuse me, internal. We're talking now in the pelvic cavity. You've got ovaries there, the uterine tubes, the uterus, and the vagina. External genitalia will now be made up of the external sex organs. The external sex organs. Now, when we talk about the uterus, we're going to be able to appreciate the uterus. You've seen the uterus. It's a nice, hollow, thick-walled, muscular organ, and it's going to receive, retain, and nourish a fertilized ova, right? It looks like an upside-down uh, uh, pear. It's got a few parts to it as well, and we can go through and we'll check those out. So here you can see a nice uh, uh, medial view, basically, here, where you can actually appreciate all the different uh, uh, systems here. You've got urinary system in its own, and then here reproductive. Right in the male, we saw these two hooked up, and then here you've got uh, basically the end of the digestive. So here then you can appreciate the vagina. This is where then the sperm is going to be uh, basically left off, and it has to make its way into the cervix, and uh, then it has to make its way up. So here's the cervix, and here you can see the uterus, the rest of the uterus, and then here we've got the fallopian tubes, and then here's the ovaries on both sides. Now we talk uh, ovaries. Uh, the ovaries uh, are going to be basically, you can see in here, made up into, uh, they're going to be divided up into a cortex and a medulla. The medulla is where you can see the blood vessels that are going to be nourishing the follicles and the growing ova. That's going to be in the cortex, right? So here you can see those follicles in various stages of growth, and then here ovulation takes place. Uh, about 14 days mid-cycle. I know cycle is not exactly a 28-day cycle. It can vary um, just uh, for uh, you know, learning purposes what we're seeing there. 
Now here you can see the egg gets ejected then makes its way through and then here you've got the remainder of the follicle that's going to become the corpus luteum and that's going to be a very important structure because it's going to be releasing some hormones. And um, then here we could go through and uh, we've got basically all the parts taken care of here. And let's check out then gamete production. Let's check out gamete production. Now when we talk gamete production, uh, let's get into the basically the physiology then. Right, the ovaries we've taken care of, we talked about. Yeah, so let's go through and we'll look at the follicles. Okay, so yeah, make sure you go through, get all that taken care of there. So let's jump to the physiology then. Now when we go through and we talk about the physiology, gamete production in males begins at puberty. And it continues throughout life. But the situation is quite different in females. It's assumed that a female's total supply of eggs is already determined by the time she is born. And the time span during which she releases them extends from puberty to menopause. Extends from puberty to menopause, which is around 50 years of age. Let's look at now oogenesis here. So before in the male we saw spermatogenesis, so here we're going to refer to it as oogenesis. Now meiosis, the specialized nuclear division that occurs in the testes to produce sperm, also occurs in the ovaries. In this case, it produces female sex cells in a process that we call oogenesis. This process of oogenesis, it takes years to complete. First, in the fetal period, oogonia, the diploid stem cells of the ovaries, the oogonia, which are the stem cells of the ovaries, are going to multiply rapidly by mitosis. Gradually, the primordial follicles appear as the oogonia transform into primary oocytes and become surrounded by a single layer of follicle cells. So here we're going to be able to go through and look at that whole process. The primary oocytes, they begin the first meiotic division. Okay, so you could see the primary sites, the primary oocytes, begin the first meiotic division. But those primary oocytes pause or we say they become stalled in prophase 1 and do not complete it. So this is all in the fetal period. This is before birth. By birth, the female is presumed to have, we said, her lifetime supply of primary oocytes. By puberty then, by puberty, females are left with a lot less actually functional oocytes than were produced. Now, when we look at oogenesis after puberty, okay, so let's start, or we look at it from puberty, so let's start at puberty, beginning at puberty, FSH is going to be involved. So here we're going to see all of this ovarian cycle come into play with then we're going to see the uterine cycle there as well. And all of this is all hooked up to those hormones. So during puberty, okay, during puberty, What's going to happen is FSH, 
let me see where we are at. Let's jump back here. Okay, so during puberty, we said that one, FSH is going to rescue a small number of growing follicles from apoptosis, which is going to be programmed cell death. So FSH rescues a small number of growing follicles from apoptosis each month. Now in each cycle, one of those rescued follicles is selected. It gets selected to become the dominant follicle and continue meiosis one. Ultimately producing two haploid cells and these two haploid cells that are going to be produced are going to be completely very dissimilar in size. The smaller cell, the smaller cell is going to be called the first polar body. The larger cell that's going to contain nearly all the cytoplasm of the primary oocytes is going to be called the secondary oocyte. Now those maturing follicles not selected are going to undergo atresia. The events of this first maturation division are going to ensure that the polar bodies receive almost no cytoplasm or organelles. So here you can see that happening. Here you can see a spindle form at the very edge and the polar body chromosomes are going to be cast right into it. Now this first polar body, it may continue its development and undergo meiosis too. And if it does, it's going to produce two even smaller polar bodies. In humans, in humans, the secondary oocyte, in humans, the secondary oocyte arrests in metaphase two. It will arrest then in metaphase two. When we talk about this whole process, uh, oh, Genesis, I forgot to mention to you guys, I like to describe it kind of like my wife when we're going to go to a wedding. Let me make sure she's not here. Now, here what happens is we know a year in advance, right? We get the wedding card a year in advance. They usually have got their venue rented out. They know who's going to be the DJ, and they've got most of their, you know, people got some of that stuff planned out. And, you know, she'll see the card. Oh, yeah. Oh, I know what I'm going to wear. Oh, I know what I'm going to, you know, how my hair is going to be. A year in advance is what she'll say. But do you think that day she's ready? Nope, nope, nope. I'm sitting outside honking the horn. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Okay. It's kind of similar to what we're seeing here. Look in the mail how ceramic is so easy. Puberty hits. Boom. GNRH comes down. FSH, LH. Everything is ready to go. Here, started in the fetal stage, arrested, pause, started up again, arrested, pause. Okay, so here now we're going to see, basically, when the sperm comes, do you think the egg's going to be ready to go? And like, all right, here we go, let's go. No, sperm's going to have to kind of wait on it for a second, we'll see. Okay, just to make this, you know, way for you to remember. So now when we go through and we see, in humans, the secondary oocyte, it arrests in metaphase 2. And it is this cell, and it's going to be this cell that's going to be ovulated. It is this cell that gets ovulated. Now, if a sperm does not penetrate an ovulated secondary oocyte, the oocyte deteriorates, right? And it's removed along with menstruation. Now, if 
sperm penetration does occur, if sperm penetration does occur, the oocyte quickly completes meiosis too. So look at here. So ovulation occurred. That egg made, it, made its way out. It's in the pathway now. And now the sperm comes. So if sperm penetration does occur, the oocyte says, hold on, let me finish. And it quickly completes meiosis too. Yielding, yielding one large ovum and a second polar body. Now the union of the egg and the sperm nuclei constitutes fertilization. So you can see meiosis 2 is only completed if that sperm penetrates. We said otherwise the egg is going to be removed along with menstrual flow. So now when we compare oogenesis and spermatogenesis, the potential end product of oogenesis are three tiny polar bodies. And they're devoid of cytoplasm and one large ovum. Only the ovum. Only this ovum is going to be a functional gamete. And this is different from spermatogenesis, right? Where the product is four viable gametes. So four viable gametes. In spermatogenesis, the error rate is anywhere from 3 to 4%. In oogenesis, one viable gamete, three polar bodies. And the error rate is 20%. And polar bodies, we said they're going to degenerate and die, basically. Let's move on then to the ovarian cycle. Now, when we talk about the ovarian cycle, the ovarian cycle is going to be basically intertwined, we'll see, with the uterine cycle. We're going to go and we're going to look at both of them. First, we'll start with the ovarian cycle, then we'll include in uh, the um, uterine cycle. Now, when we talk ovarian cycle, the monthly series of events associated with menstruation of an egg is called the ovarian cycle. The ovarian cycle is going to consist of two consecutive phases. The follicular phase and the luteal phase with ovulation occurring mid-cycle. And you can see that. Well, you can see that basically right inside of here. But to get it in more detail, you, we're going to probably just look at this one picture here and do everything from here. Right here. So when we talk ovarian cycle, Ovarian cycle is going to be, we said, made up of two consecutive phases, the follicular phase and the luteal phase. The follicular phase and then the luteal phase we're going to look at with ovulation occurring, we said, mid-cycle. The typical ovarian cycle repeats at intervals of 28 days. I know, I know, I know, I know. That's not right. It's textbook. They can vary from basically 40-day cycles to 21-day cycles. Okay? I'm just talking textbook. I'm just talking textbook. I know clinically, I, I never saw that. I Maybe once, maybe a patient or two, maybe if I was lucky here or there, they have the 28-day cycle. But no, clinically, I never saw that. I mean, it's like it says, anywhere from 21 to 40 days. Now, the follicular phase... The follicular phase is the period when the dominant follicle is going to be selected. It's when the dominant follicle is selected and begins to secrete a large amount of estrogen. So here you can see now, estrogen levels are also increasing because we're in the follicular phase. It generally lasts from the 1st to the 14th day of the cycle. 
at which point ovulation typically occurs. The events of the follicular phase are as follows. First, a primordial follicle, we'll see, becomes a primary follicle. Now here what happens is the primordial follicle gets activated. So we can come back over here and we could relate that. So basically right inside of here. So again now, we're in the follicular phase. We're talking about when the primordial follicle becomes a primary follicle. So here you could see squamous-like cells are going to become cuboidal and the oocyte begins to enlarge. The primordial follicle is activated. Its cells grow from squamous-like to cuboidal and the oocyte enlarges and becomes known as a primary follicle. So right in here then, we're able to see basically, or actually even better, we can move back right here. Here you can see the primary follicle. Next then we can see this primary follicle is going to become a secondary follicle. Here, follicular cells proliferate, forming more than one layer of cells around the oocytes, helping to form then a secondary follicle. Then when we talk about the secondary follicle becoming a late secondary follicle, in this stage, a layer of connective tissue and epithelial cells condenses around the follicle, condenses around the follicle, forming a theca folliculi. A box basically around the follicle forming a box around the follicle at the end of this stage a clear liquid begins to accumulate producing then the secondary follicle producing then the secondary follicle Next then we have the stage where the late secondary follicle becomes a vesicular or an antral follicle as we see here now. Now, in this stage, the fluid between the granulose cells, it coalesces, it comes together to form this nice large fluid filled cavity that we call the antrum, the antrum. Now, once the follicle matures, that stage is going to be set then for ovulation. Now, when we talk ovulation, ovulation occurs when the ballooning ovary wall ruptures. You can see that ballooning ovary wall ruptures and expels the secondary oocyte. The follicle is at peak stage of maturation when the hormonal LH stimulus is given for ovulation. FSH levels are also increased. And FSH, I want you to know, plays a role in selecting the dominant follicle. Now, sometimes more than one egg is ovulated and they can be fertilized by two different sperm forming fraternal or non-identical twins. Now, when we talk identical twins, identical twins, they result from fertilization of a single oocyte by a single sperm followed by separation of that fertilized egg.
Next then we have ovulation occur. So when ovulation occurs, the ovary wall ruptures. This is, is going to expel that secondary oocyte we said. And then also we can see what's going to happen is pain. Pain is going to also be felt at ovulation. And that pain there is basically, you can see, known as middle schmerz. It's basically the pain that's sometimes felt at ovulation. And 1 to 2 percent of ovulations release more than one secondary oocyte, which then, if, if fertilized, 1 to 2 percent of ovulations release more than one secondary oocyte, which, if fertilized, results in fraternal twins, as we mentioned. Now, when we move through then, we move through and we can talk then luteal phase. So when we talk luteal phase, the luteal phase is going to be after ovulation. So now, after ovulation, the ruptured follicle collapses. And the antrum fills with blood and it gets absorbed. Granulose cells are going to form a corpus luteum which then is going to be important because it's going to secrete progesterone and estrogen. Now, if pregnancy does not occur, the corpus luteum will degenerate. But if the oocyte is fertilized and pregnancy ensues, the corpus luteum will persist. It will persist until the placenta can take over hormone producing capabilities. So let's move on then to, you can see now, establishing the ovarian cycle. Now during childhood, the ovaries grow and they secrete small amounts of estrogens that inhibit hypothalamic release of GnRH. But then as puberty nears, GnRH is released. GnRH, the pituitary gonadotropins, the ovarian estrogen and progesterone are all going to interact. They're going to interact to produce cyclic changes in the ovaries. Now in females, Leptin, which comes from fatty tissues, plays a role in stimulating the hypothalamus to release GnRH. If blood levels of lipids and leptin are low, this can delay puberty. Now, when we talk establishing the ovarian cycle, as puberty begins, GnRH stimulates the anterior pituitary to release FSH and LH, which will signal the ovaries to secrete hormones, primarily estrogens. Now, when a young female has her first menstrual period, it's referred to as menarche. It's referred to as Menarche. Now, when we look at the hormonal interaction during the ovarian cycle, so we said GnRH secreted by the hypothalamus is going to stimulate, it will stimulate, okay, so here we could see GnRH from this. Hypothalamus stimulates FSH and LH. 
FSH and LH, they stimulate the follicles basically to grow. FSH and LH stimulate the follicle to grow, to mature, and to secrete sex hormones. FSH will exert its effects on granulosa cells, causing them to release estrogens. LH will cause fecal cells to produce androgens that are going to get converted eventually to estrogen. Negative feedback, negative feedback inhibits gonadotropin release. FSH is release and LH release. Inhibin released by the granulosa cells. Inhibin released by the granulosa cells is going to exert a negative feedback on to FSH. Positive feedback stimulates gonadotropin release and it's caused by the estrogen produced from the dominant follicle. Here we can see LH is surge. The surge of LH is going to trigger ovulation and the formation of the corpus luteum. Negative feedback inhibits LH and FSH's release. So now here, when we intertwine everything with the uterine cycle and the menstrual cycle, you can see, here we'll go through, you can see the uterus is going to be receptive only to implantation for a short period. And not surprisingly, that short period happens to be six to seven days after ovulation. So the egg can't just come, you know, 15 days later and, uh, uh, you know, try to implant itself there. That's not going to happen. The uterine cycle is a series of cyclic changes that the uterine endometrium goes through each month in response to ovarian hormone levels. Days 1 through 5 are considered the menstrual phase. In this phase, the uterus sheds all but its deepest layer. This is a process that is accompanied by bleeding for three to five days. Then we have days six through 14, or the proliferative or pre-ovulatory phase. Now in this phase, the endometrium rebuilds itself. Rising estrogen levels prompt are going to prompt generation of new stratum functionalis. Also, you're going to have increased synthesis of progesterone receptors in the endometrium. Glands are going to enlarge and spiral arteries increase in number. We're going to see all of that. Normally thick, sticky cervical mucus thins in response to rising estrogens, so it allows sperm's passage. And then ovulation occurs at the end of proliferative phase, leading us to then the secretory phase, the post-ovulatory phase. Here, the endometrium prepares for implantation of an embryo. This phase is most constant time-wise. The endometrium prepares for the embryo, as we said. And here, we're going to be able to go through and we're going to be able to see, basically, what all is going to happen during now this phase here in relation to the thickness of that uterus, you can see. So let's actually put everything together. So here you can see now the uh, rising levels of LH and FSH. LH, we said, is going to trigger ovulation. <clears throat> FSH is important in selecting the dominant, dominant follicle. And as that follicle is growing, you can see it gets estrogen levels to increase. 
Now here, right before ovulation, so pre-ovulatory phase you can see here, here we saw now the endometrium thickening after menstrual flow had occurred, menstruation had occurred. You can see now the thickness here. Here's the stratum basale and the stratum functionalis is a lighter pink in top, like the uh, peach color. So here you can see how even that layer begins to thicken and look at these spiral arteries, okay, and basically glands all starting to form inside of here as well. So then we move from ovulation into then the luteal phase. So here then in the luteal phase, you can see that thickness now in the quantity of blood vessels and glands. So the endometrium, as we said, is preparing for implantation of an embryo. And if no implantation occurs, right, if no implantation is going to occur, then what's going to happen? This layer is going to be shed, and that will be accompanied with blood flow, starting the cycle all over again. So here you can see now, progesterone levels don't increase until after ovulation. And when progesterone levels start to increase, you can see estrogen levels are going to start to decrease. And along with that, right, you can see everything that's happening, as we explained before, with the follicle and the egg and then the corpus luteum. 